Okay, our next speaker is going to be Cathy Klo from the University of Guelph, and uh, she's going to talk about ticks and Borrelia burgdorferi. Okay, good morning everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak this morning on just a, an initial glimpse on some of the research we've been doing on Lyme disease in Ontario. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, the distribution of the, the tick Ixodi scapularis and the bacterial infection Borrelia burgdorferi, specifically in the province of Ontario. So just as a little outline, I'll give you a little background on Lyme disease. Um, I know that Sean kind of um, gave a nice introduction this morning, so made my job easy. Um, and then look at the objectives of our study, um, our methodology, and then the more exciting results and significance. Um, so as you may already know, um, Lyme disease is the most common vector-borne disease in North America. Um, I think last year the CDC reported just under 30,000 cases in the states, so has a significant burden of disease. Um, the causative agent is the bacterial spirochete Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, and on this slide I'm specifically referring to in Eastern North America because it changes based on geography. Um, the vector are the nymphal and adult stages of the black-legged tick, Ixodes scapularis. And um, our reservoir are small mammals, and the poster child for this is the white-footed mouse, but we also see it in other small mammals such as shrews. Um, for the susceptible species, um, humans are the most commonly affected. Um, dogs can develop clinical disease um, as well, but to a lesser degree. Um, and Sean, we, we have the same pictures, um, mostly because this is an excellent picture that depicts the life cycle of the tick. Um, the tick has a two-year life cycle, um, and it varies based on seasonality. Um, so as you can see here in the middle, the eggs are laid in the spring, um, and they will go on to hatch into larva in the summer. Larva are uninfected um, because the mother tick does not transmit the bacteria through to the egg. Um, the larva can become infected um, if they take a blood meal on a, a, small, a small mammal um, that is carrying the bacteria. Um, the larva will go on to overwinter and molt the following spring into nymphs, and that it's that life stage that is able to transmit the bacteria. Um, nymphs pose the greatest risk of human disease because they're so small, about the size of a sesame seed. Um, it's very difficult for um, the human, the naked eye, to recognize them, um, so they can become attached and feed for long enough to transmit the bacteria. Um, and they're also active in the springtime when everybody's out enjoying um, freedom from the long winter, you know, their shorts and t-shirts, so exposure is, can be significantly greater. Um, nymphs can still feed on small mammals and they'll feed on, on larger mammals as well. Um, and then they will go on after their blood meal to molt into adults um, that are that active in the fall. And adults prefer to take blood meals on larger things or larger mammals um, and the white-tailed deer is the preferred host for the adults. Um, once they've had a good blood meal, they can go on, um, start the cycle again, and the eggs are laid in the spring. Um, so I, I put this slide in here to kind of frame where our research has sort of launched out of. Um, so prior to 1990, um, there was only one known population of the black-legged ticks in Ontario and in Canada, and that was at Long Point Provincial Park. And there's evidence that that population was there for a very long time, but stayed isolated in that area. And then fast forward two and a half decades and we see this rapid expansion of the tick um, northward across um, Canada um, and specifically we're looking at Ontario. And this has been linked to both climate change um, and a lot of introduction of the tick through migratory birds. Um, so moving from one endemic area in 1990 to over eight, and, to eight known endemic areas in Ontario right now. Um, and we say eight, but the distribution is believed to be much greater um, as a large number of cases and a large number of ticks um, are reported from areas outside of these endemic areas um, without travel um, or exposure in these endemic areas. And then our last point, um, which kind of frames as, as we move forward, um, that the ecology of Lyme disease is complex. Um, and as you can see, just a glimpse from the, the previous diagram that it's involving a number of, of hosts um, and different climates. So we're looking at a number of ecological factors that are influencing this cycle of disease. Um, so the objectives of the, the preliminary study that we've done 
are to determine the current distribution of Ixodes scapularis and as well as other tick species in Ontario and then strengthen our current understanding of that geographic risk associated with Borrelia burgdorferi and other tick-borne pathogens of public health significance. Um, so for our research, um, we endeavored to visit 50 sites um, over three ecoregions in central and southern Ontario. Um, so on a map coming up, I will show you these ecoregions. The, region, the reason we chose these sort of divisions is there are three more distinct ecological areas um, where the climate is sufficient enough to support the life cycle of the black-legged tick. Um, and so in total, we wanted to visit 150 sites. Um, the basic criteria we chose for site selection was it had to be a forested area. And the reason for this is we know that the black-legged tick likes to live in forested areas. They need that protection um, to prevent against desiccation and they need the vegetation to climb up and find their blood meal. Um, and then the last two criteria, the, the minimum size and the accessibility, are based strictly on us being able to, to conduct our research there. Um, and then we visited each site um, once from May to October, which is the active season of the black-legged tick. Um, and at these site visits, we were conducting two, uh, two different things. So the first is active surveillance, which Sean had mentioned. We're, in, we're looking like the bounty paper picker upper man. Um, so we're dressed in these um, biohazard suits and dragging a one by, one by one meter squared flannel blanket across the vegetation and the forest floor um, to capture the ticks. Um, it is a quite systematic method, so we're going out in parallel transects um, and stopping every three minutes to check our blankets and check um, our clothing for ticks. And then the clock restarts again, and that's for a total of three person hours. Um, all the ticks, uh, all life stages of ticks are counted. Um, the nymphal ticks and the adult ticks are collected and then submitted for testing. Um, at each of these sites, we're also collecting um, basic ecological data, so looking at the temperature and the relative humidity, the site aspect, which is, you know, is it hilly, is it flat, is it variable, um, the tree and understory composition, the soil composition and moisture level, and then the depth of the litter layer, which is that leafy layer on the ground. And then looking at what kind of data analysis we've done. So all of our tick samples are submitted to the National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg um, for PCR testing for Borrelia burgdorferi, as well as three other um, tick-borne pathogens of public health significance. Um, from there, we conducted some basic statistic statistical analysis looking at the prevalence of the tick and the bacteria in each ecoregion and comparing those ecoregions and seeing if there's any specific patterns that we can see. Um, we further uh, did spatial analysis, uh, projecting all of our data with QGIS, and then um, Michelle did a great job talking about cluster analysis, and we uh, used SatScan to look at any specific uh, site clusters that we, we found with our research. Um, so this chart just looks like a whole bunch of numbers, um, but is really a reflection of a, a, whole, uh, a whole summer of field work. Um, so we were able to visit 108 sites, we did fall short of our goal. Um, a big reason is last year we had quite a wet summer and you can't tick drag in the rain. So as soon as it starts raining, your, your field day is over. Um, so to our best efforts, we were able to get to 108 sites and we are working on improving our sample size this year. Um, uh, out of those 108 sites, we found ticks, uh, black-legged ticks at 21 sites. Um, and then five sites tested positive for the bacteria. So that equates to a 19%, 19% of our sites um, had the tick and then five, about 5% were positive for Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, we didn't detect any significant difference between any of these ecoregions and the presence or absence of ticks or the bacteria. Um, and then the additional sample uh, testing that we did with the, the other pathogens of public health significance, they were all negative. On, that was on the bottom, I guess. my got cut off a little bit. but um, And then this one looks at um, other tick species that we were able to collect during our testing. Um, so our sampling methods were biased towards collecting Ixodes scapularis because we're in the habitat where we know that Ixodes scapularis uh, thrives versus if you look at the dog tick, the dog tick is more likely to be found in long grasses. So we didn't expect to find necessarily um, any other tick species, but we did, which is quite exciting. Um, so we did find a number of sites where we had dog ticks. Um, so seven sites, 
Um, and then we found nine sites of, forgive me if I pronounce this wrong, Haemophysalis leporis palustris, which is nicely called the rabbit tick, so uh, if you prefer to call it that, it's much easier. Um, so we found those at nine sites, um, and then uh, just one site where there was an Ixodes dentatus. Um, for public health significance, these do not, at least in Ontario, um, do not represent a risk for, for, uh, for public health. Um, but as you know, if you get further into the southern United States, they do worry about the dog ticks. So it's a, an important part of ongoing surveillance. Um, looking at the difference, uh, we did find that there's a lot more rabbit ticks in, you're more likely to find rabbit ticks in ecoregion 5E, so a little bit further north, um, versus the more southern um, ecoregion 7E. So, um, there's a lot of different colors on this map, but I'd like to take the time to, to really explain it. So, as I was talking about ecoregions, um, on this map um, we have ecoregion 7E, which is the most southern one. Um, ecoregion 6E, which you know, spans a pretty large area. And then 5E, which goes all the way up to Sault Ste. Marie. So, uh, last summer our field team was all over the province, uh, or all over the southern area of the province. Um, and so the, the black diamonds are places where we didn't find any black-legged ticks. The uh, white diamonds are, there's a few of them, areas that are unknown as we found the larva and they were not able to be identified. Um, and they're also not tested, so we don't really know the, the status of that site. And then the, the red stars are where we found black-legged ticks. Um, and overlaid on that layer are the other ticks as well. So you can see sites where there's multiple species of ticks being detected. Um, the green dots are the, the dog ticks, the orange dots are the rabbit ticks, and then our one finding of Ixodes dentatus um, just in, in this area. Um, and as Michelle explained, uh, we did do some cluster analysis. Um, and so here, as you can see, which it's not a huge surprise based on how many red stars are in that area. Um, we do have a cluster of sites um, where it's more likely to find a site that is positive um, with the black-legged tick than, by due, than due to chance alone. So we do have a cluster of, of black-legged ticks um, in the eastern Ontario region. If we skip ahead um, and look at our lab findings, um, so again, the black dots are places where there was no black-legged ticks, and then uh, the orange, uh, white triangle, sorry, um, are those unknown sites where we only found larva and we're not testing those for Borrelia because they, they can't carry it yet. Um, and then green sites are where the tick was there but the bacteria was not present. And then the red sites are our positive sites. And as you can see uh, with that cluster, there's an overlaid cluster um, where we're finding the ticks and we're also finding the bacteria in that so-called hot spot of eastern Ontario. Um, so what is the significance of, of, of all of this? Um, the first is that with this, we can really validate and strengthen the findings of passive surveillance. Passive surveillance has been conducted in the province for, for years, and it's contributed a wealth of information to what we know about the risk of Lyme disease. And by going out and conducting active surveillance, we can really validate a lot of those findings um, and explain some of the things um, that passive surveillance may not be able to. So together, they really complement each other. Um, with these findings, we now have a current baseline for where we're seeing the black-legged tick. And that is really important going forward, um, knowing that there are a lot of predictions that this trend of expansion and um, increased risk are, is going to continue. So having this baseline gives us um, a great starting point for comparison and monitoring moving forward. And with that baseline, um, we can then direct our surveillance efforts to the appropriate areas and target our public health preventative measures based on the risk that we, uh, of where we know the tick and the bacteria are. So next steps, as I said, um, this is just a, a, a very small glimpse into the research that we're doing. Um, so the next steps are to take a lot of that ecological data that we have and understand how those factors are affecting the establishment and distribution of uh, the black-legged tick and the presence of Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, we're gonna, we will look at habitat suitabil suitability based on the abiotic and biotic factors, and then um, looking at spatial spread as well. Um, with that, we want to develop and validate predictive models um, for future establishment of the black-legged tick and the risk of Lyme disease. 
and then um, specifically look at the spatial dynamics of how the tick and the bacteria are spreading in a recent zone of emergence, so looking at that hot spot area um, in eastern Ontario. So I'd just like to take a, a few moments to thank my funding sources, um, NSERC, the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and two grants from the Ontario Veterinary College. Um, and then this work would not have been possible without the guidance from my advisory committee um, and all the help from my field team, most of them which are sitting over there, um, with a huge, huge amount of effort last summer and this summer. Um, the assistance by Dr. Robin Lindsay of testing all of our ticks. Um, the collaboration with the Public Health Ontario and Ontario Public Health Units who have really helped get um, some of this surveillance done and it's a great partnership um, as we should be working together. Um, and then site access to Ontario parks and um, numerous conservation areas. And so now there's time for questions. If Question about ticks and Borrelia? Yeah? Well, you know, here. <laughs> what uh, criteria did you use to delineate the three regions of the map? So, those are pre established areas um, by the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources. Um, I don't remember when they were I introduced, um, but they're all based on kind of coarse climatic and ge geological patterns. So, something not done by us. Thanks for that. We know in eastern Ontario there's known endemic areas. How did you work with the local health units? Because I assume what you found is not within areas where we already know we've got myxoides with Borrelia. Uh, how did you select areas? Because I assume that means that there's some documentation of expansion of previously more limited endemic areas. Right. Um, so we did work with the health unit in eastern Ontario um, and we worked with them on the site selection and what they wanted to do, which makes complete sense, is go to areas where they had no data from and, and go that way because there's no use in us resampling where we already know that it is. Um, and so that was kind of the basic criteria is that we um, matched our basic criteria with that they wanted to look at specific regions um, and places where the public could potentially be exposed as well. So we're looking at common hiking trails and parks, um, and that's how that site selection was conducted. So right now the, the plan is to at least get our 150 sites visited once. Um, I can't comment on how far that's going to go into the, into the future. I would love to keep doing it. Um, it won't be part of my PhD research. Um, but as we kind of know where the sites are positive and where they're negative, um, it can either, okay, we know that it's established there, we're not going to keep doing active surveillance, but we can kind of look at the areas as to where it's spreading and see if this is going to be a risk area and continue to sample there. Did that sort of answer your question? Yes, it did, but just a follow-up question if I might. Um, so you used the word established. Is there a definition of established? There is. I'm probably not the best person to answer that because the definition has changed quite a bit. Um, I can point you to either Curtis Russell or the gentleman sitting beside you and they can probably answer that question better. Maybe a last one? Just a question about the type of those projection models that are currently out there that have been published. Were your findings consistent with what they had predicted? Um, so the projection models kind of, at least the ones that I've been looking at, are like 2020, 2050, 2080. Um, and so all of those are based on, or the ones at least that I've been looking at, really focus on climate. Um, and so, yes, we were finding ticks within that area where it says that the climate is supportive. Um, we're looking at taking that one step further and saying, so the climate is important, it's kind of a, a deciding factor of whether the tick can complete its life cycle or not. Um, and if you don't have a supportive climate, the tick will die out. Um, but climate is not the only thing that is going to allow the tick to thrive and expand. And so we want to um, overlay that 
the, those climate, model, climate models um, and incorporate all the ecological factors to be like, yes, this, the climate is supportive here, but the habitat isn't, and be able to sort of strengthen those predictive models that way. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Ken. Thank Okay, I, I hear people coming from the other room and I think I know why. So <laughs> I think it's time for lunch and uh, we'll reconvene I think at 1.30. Uh, again, in the two, oh, there is a main session in that room and then we'll separate again in the two rooms. And uh, during lunchtime you are welcome to look at the posters again. Please.